books are for losers. Um, Uh, drink some co Coors? Lo lose losers. Losers. Um. I'm gonna go do hers. progressively more unbelievable stories and at the end of each of them i'm going to show you the photo that is famously associated with that story but before we get into those stories if you're a fan of the strange dark and mysterious delivered in story format Mars? then you come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week so if that's of interest nice to you save. It wasn't please offer to refill the like button's keurig coffee machine water tank keurig suck don't use Keurig. You'll get cancer. I don't know if you'll get cancer. I just know Keurig coffee is shit. With 2017, a 25 year old <laughs> farmer named Akbar Salabiro was harvesting palm now, food at name. the local. That is a name. Akbar Salabiro. Oil palm grove near his tiny village <laughs> in Indonesia. Now, the way I Akbar like would do this is he would use this long curved pole and he would prod at the bright red fruit in the tree, knocking it to the ground, and then he would gather it up, put it in his cart, and wheel it back home to be sold for palm oil. Now, on this night, Akbar was actually working later than usual because his wife yeah, and kids were out of town for a couple of days visiting family, so and so there was no real reason to head back home because the house was empty. But Akbar was actually just fine with that because there was tons of ripe fruit, and so staying late would be quite profitable. <laughs> But after a while, when the sun had finally set and it was getting difficult to actually even see the fruit in the tree, Akbar knew he really needed to leave soon because this area at night was actually not safe. And so Akbar gathered up the remainder of his fruit on the ground, he put his pole in the cart as well, and he began quickly making his way back home. Later that evening, one of Akbar's neighbors was asleep in their bed inside of their home when they woke up suddenly to the sound of something out in the jungle, not far from where Akbar had been harvesting palm fruit. And so this neighbor, when they sat up, they couldn't really tell what the sound was. It almost sounded like a stifled scream or maybe some animal that was fighting with another animal. Aliens. But as the neighbor sat there straining their ears to try to hear it again, they didn't. All they heard was normal sounds coming from the outside. And so the neighbor decided that the sound they heard must have been a cat or maybe a monkey. And, you know, whatever it was, it couldn't have been a big deal. And so a cat or a monkey. Those are those are two drastically different sounding animals. You wouldn't mistake a cat for a monkey. Monkeys go, ooh, ooh. ah, ah. <laughs> Cats fucking meow and hiss. Disappointed. Well, this neighbor went back to sleep. The following <laughs> evening, so 24 hours later, another one of Akbar's neighbors walked outside of their home to begin the walk over to the jungle to harvest palm fruit. And when they went outside, normally around this time, Akbar would be coming outside as well because these two often went to the grove together. But, you know, this neighbor is looking and Akbar is not outside and he looks up at Akbar's house and it's dark and quiet. And so this neighbor is thinking to themselves, you know, where is Akbar? You know, I know he worked late last night. I didn't hear him come in and come to think of it. You know, I haven't seen him all day. And now, of course, I'm not seeing him as well. Yeah, and so yeah. this neighbor, feeling concerned about Akbar, walked over and knocked on his door, but nobody answered. And so really starting to think that something could be wrong with Akbar, this neighbor went to Akbar's uncle's house. And when Akbar's uncle came to the door, this neighbor explained what was going on and their concern that, you know, something could have happened to Akbar. And so the uncle and this neighbor would go back over to Akbar's home and they would actually try the door. It was locked. They looked inside the windows and it looked like no one was in there. And they also noticed that where Akbar typically kept his cart that he would transport his fruit in, it wasn't there either, which made them think, you know, Akbar must still be out somewhere with this cart because this card is very important to him. And so ultimately, the uncle, after seeing the state of his nephew's home, 
he agreed with this neighbor that, you know, something was wrong here. And if they wanted to find Akbar, they really needed to get together a search party right now and go <laughs> looking for him. So I love when Binding Pig said it's ballin' time and bald everywhere. When Pig said it's monkey time and went ooh, ooh, ah, ah. I did none of those things. Concentrate, right. So the uncle contacted the leaders of the village, and they, in turn, rounded up all the able-bodied men in the village, and they all got yo, together yo, with yo, what's wrong with all the non-able-bodied people? Uh, I don't know why. I don't know why I thought that was funny. <laughs> the the fa I don't know why it's always funny when it's able-bodied. What, what's up? That's discriminatory against the non-able-bodied people. What would you call them? Broken. <laughs> Broken people. Uh, uh. I am. I am off. I am off my rocker today. I am out. I am out. I'm out of it. Atlanta's they don't have arms or legs. How do you know? How do you know? What if? What if he just means old? Or young, get little Johnny out there. He could search the little cut, the little, little crevices, you know. Flashlights and machetes and knives, and then all together they began walking away from the village into the jungle in the direction of this palm grove, which was the place that Akbar had been last. And so this big group of men they get inside the jungle mm, and they begin walking along this men. path, which was the most likely path that Akbar would have taken to go to the palm grove and also to return from the palm grove. And as they're walking, you know, the sun is starting to set, it's getting dark, and the animals in the jungle they're all making noises. Oh! And kind of yelling at this group as they're moving through. What are those called and again? This group, they're shining their light around looking for any sign of Akbar, but there wasn't any. They were calling his name out, there was no response. And then at some point, as they got closer to the palm grove, they noticed there were I never a couple of bright cute. red fruits, palm fruits, that had clearly been <laughs> recently harvested <laughs> that were <laughs> Is it not a muskrat? Wait. Wait, what is it? They look cool, they have big eyes. Scattered on the trail. And so the group began to fan out in this area, thinking that, oh my goodness, Akbar must be somewhere nearby. You know, maybe there was some sort Tarzan? of accident and he's fallen somewhere, nah, or just something's out. happened to him, but he's gotta be in this area. And so the group began fanning out off the trail, kind of hacking their way through all the underbrush. And then suddenly one of the men, after he hacked through a particularly dense stretch he of the jungle, his head off. he looked down and saw something oh. and began to scream and he raised his machete and began running forward. As far as we can tell, this is what happened to Akbar. The previous night after Akbar had decided, you know, it wasn't safe to be in the jungle at night, he needed- Now that's, um, that's, that's a, that's a freaking Chad. He screamed and instead of running away, he went, Ah! It just started running toward whatever the danger is. Now that's a badass. To leave, and so he gathered up all of his things I'm, I'm and he began walking bringing, along that streaming. path where the search party would find all that fruit scattered on the trail. And so he's walking along this path and he thinks he's alone, he thinks he's okay, but in reality, he wasn't. He was being watched and followed very closely from something up in the trees. And so as Akbar moved along, this thing was kind of trailing him and seeing what he was going to do. And then at some point, this thing up in the trees began moving its way down closer and closer to Akbar. It was a 23 foot long reticulated python. It was a massive snake. And this snake came down and launched an attack on Akbar, grabbing the back of his neck with its powerful jaws. Jesus and as soon Christ. as the snake clamped down on Akbar's <clears throat> neck, he let out a stifled scream, which was the scream that had woken up that other neighbor who sat up in bed wondering what that was. That was Akbar screaming wow. out. But that was the only sound Akbar could make because immediately the snake wrapped itself all around Akbar and squeezed him tight. And after crushing Akbar, breaking almost every bone in his body, uh. the snake relaxed and then slithered off of Akbar. And so Akbar <laughs> fell to the ground and was either dead or very close to death. And at this point, the snake opened up its jaws and positioned itself right in front of Akbar. Don't tell me he actually tries to eat him whole. Ain't no way that snake actually is going to eat him. 
Akbar's head, and then it began kind of slithering itself forward, consuming Akbar head first. And the way pythons do this is they don't really chew on their victim. Dude, you know that scene in uh, Snakes on a Plane where, like, the dude gets swallowed whole by the snake? I didn't think that shit actually happened. Them. Instead, they kind of put their mouth over the top of whatever they're going to consume, and they kind of undulate and walk their bodies forward, driving the victim deeper and deeper into their body until they are completely consumed. And so the next night, when one of the members of the search party had gone off the trail and began hacking away and then saw something and charged after it with his machete, what he was seeing was the python who very clearly had a- Oh my god! Jesus Christ! A person inside of its stomach. You could see the outline of the person. And so this search party member ran forward and hacked the snake, opened it up, and there was Akbar fully dressed and deceased inside of the snake. Wait, was this supposed to be the picture? Jesus Christ. He must have not been very large. Hmm. Is there actually a video of, or a, a, a picture of him, like, out of the body, out of the snake? They had his dead body in the video. Wait, this is the video? Jesus Christ. On the night of February 19th, 2022, a 41-year-old woman named Paula Ruiz was working the reception desk at a four-star hotel in southern Mexico. It had been a long Saturday Dude, night, awesome lots of tourists video. checking the in. The only thing we can hope for is that he died before he got swallowed. Like, imagine he was, like, still alive, but was, like, stuck. Like, he's still alive, but his entire body is broken. And he just has to sit there and just watch the snake swallow him. Lots of confused tourists asking for directions or clarifications about things in the area. But it was finally nearing 11 p.m., which was the end of Paula's shift. And also things had calmed down near the reception desk. There wasn't much going on. And so Paula took a moment and grabbed her phone and checked it. And she saw there was a text message from her 19-year-old son saying he would be picking her up after work on his motorbike. And then just a couple of minutes later, Miguel, her son, actually walked in the front door of the hotel. He waved to his mom and said, you know, hey, I parked my motorbike just down the street. You know, whenever you're ready, we can leave. And so Paula, she was very happy to see her son. She walked over, she gave him a kiss and a hug, and then she began gathering her things. Paula sick. loved oh, the great. fact that her son was totally comfortable driving around town with his mom on the back of his motorcycle. Other teenagers might think that was awkward, but not Miguel. But Paula knew her son absolutely loved his motorbike and basically was always looking for an excuse to ride it. And so very likely that was why he was so eager to give his mom a ride home. And so finally, after Paula had gathered up her things and said goodbye to her coworkers, she and her son walked out the front doors of the hotel and they began walking down the road and around the corner to where Miguel always parked his bike whenever he picked his mom up from work. However, when they turned the corner and looked at the spot where Miguel said he had parked, his bike wasn't there. Now, <clears throat> a little tip, yelling at me in all caps to watch something normally makes me not want to watch it. At first, Paula asked Miguel, you know, are you sure you parked it here? You know, maybe did you park it farther down the road? But Miguel said, no, this is where I always park. I definitely parked it right here. And so Miguel became convinced that someone must have stolen his bike. That was the only explanation that made sense. Darn. But Miguel still had the keys to his motorcycle, which meant whoever had stolen it had likely hotwired it. And since that takes I already quite watched Next Poe's new video. Quite a bit of time to pull off components of the bike. I forgot to post it on the YouTube today. Oh, shit. That's what I forgot to do. I forgot to schedule that shit. It's already on my channel. I just forgot to post it. Oopsies. Oopsies. You can watch it tomorrow. <laughs> and kind of fiddle around with the wires to make it start. Miguel was thinking that, you know, okay, maybe they're still in the area trying to hotwire it. Let's go look for them and get the bike back. Now, the city in southern Mexico where Paula and Miguel lived was called San Cristobal de las Casas. And it was a totally beautiful place surrounded by all these hills. 
but it was also a very dangerous place, full of lots of street crime and violence and gangs that used the area as a hotspot for drug trafficking. Oh, wonderful. And so this is not really a good place to be walking around at night, let alone trying to chase down some bike thief. But Paula and Miguel, they knew this. They lived there. They understood the risks. And Paula especially, she knew that Miguel was going to go looking for this bike because he loved that bike. And so Paula didn't hesitate and said, okay, Miguel, let's go looking. And she figured at a minimum, she could take a video or a picture of the thief if they found them with the bike, and then they could give that to police, and then maybe they could track the person down if Miguel and Paula couldn't get the bike back that night. And so Paula and- Guys question are you bored are you guys bored right now are you not entertained now let me let me look at chat here god it's so damn hot today oh you should watch nick crowley oh wendigoon's fnaf lore video uh can you please watch maddie ball's channel hey can you watch the arg videos of uh uh wendigoon watch wendigoon or whatever uh yes wendigoon has so many good videos uh do you guys just want me to stop? <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. All I see in my chat is, watch this, watch this, watch this. We're watching something. We're in the middle of watching something. You whiny children. Grow up. All right? Jesus Christ. I'm not going to watch something if you're just spamming it in my chat. Okay? I don't want to. I'm watching something right now. God. And Miguel began running down Jesus these side Christ. streets looking all over the place for Miguel's bike. And you got a picture of some narrow alleyways with barely any lighting. I mean, this is a sketchy area. And so they're running around. And then finally, they turn a corner and Miguel sees up ahead his distinctive yellow motorbike. And he sees some strangers pushing it along. Clearly, this person is pushing it away so they can hotwire it. And so Miguel and Paula begin charging down the road and Miguel actually gets in front of this guy and stops him. And Miguel starts screaming at the guy to give him his bike back. And then Paula, she joins her son and she starts screaming at him as well and taking videos and pictures. And then as this is happening, another man on a motorbike came flying up behind Paula and Miguel. And as they did, Paula and Miguel heard the sound of the engine and they turned around and all Paula saw was this young man holding a gun aiming it at her son, Miguel, right at his chest. And so her motherly Jeez. instincts kicked in and she leapt in front of her son and then not knowing what else to do, she raised her phone and took a picture. And then seconds later, there was a loud bang. And then suddenly this guy who had been trying to steal Miguel's bike gave it up. He dropped the bike. He took off running down the road. And the gunman, he too turned his bike around and sped off down the Jesus road, Christ. leaving Miguel and Paula in the alleyway. <clears throat> Except Paula was on the ground because a second after she took that photo, the gunman had shot her in the chest. Paula would be taken to the hospital, but she would die the following morning, orphaning Miguel and his three siblings. However, the photo that Paula took of her killer seconds before he killed her was such a high quality photo showing his oh, face. Oh, I, wait, I've seen that. I've seen this one. That just two days after her murder, police were able to use that photo to find the killer as well as his accomplice, and they were both arrested. Where have we seen that? I've definitely seen that one before. It was if pretty big for a bit. Oh, okay. So we've probably just seen it in uh, just by being alive in today's world. What have they done to us? What do they do to us? What the fuck is this world? A 17-year-old girl named Miche Solomon was packing up her homework in between bites of her breakfast. And as she did this, her mother, Lavana, walked into the kitchen with a big smile on her face, and she was holding up this beautiful red flowing dress, and immediately Miche knew what it was. Her mom had been making this dress by hand over the past couple of days. It was for a big school dance that was coming up, and she saw that it was now done. And so Miche, she put down her breakfast and her homework, and she rushed over to her mom, and she admired this gorgeous gorgeous dress and thank you people who like spend time to make dresses for their children that's crazy dude i want to shave your head
No. I don't want to. Your mom for all the hard work and said it's absolutely <clears throat> perfect. I don't want to. And wanna. then from somewhere behind Miche, her father, who was still sitting at the table, kind of grunted out, hey, isn't that dress a little bit revealing? And Misha and her mom kind of just rolled their eyes. Were you there, Bolin? Misha's dad just loved his daughter and was How very, you know this very small protective talk? of her. How so do you know this small Basically, anything talk? she wore that wasn't full coverage was too revealing. And so Misha, after rolling her eyes, walked over to her dad. She gave him a big hug and a kiss. And she said, Dad, don't worry about it. It's just fine. And so after that, Misha went back to her breakfast. Bolin she finished eating. She dress. packed up her stuff. And then she gave her mom and her dad another hug and a kiss and said goodbye. And then she headed out the front door out to the road where her aunt was waiting in her car. As Misha's aunt drove her to school like she did almost every single Dude, it's already been 15 minutes into this video. Time flies. You know what that reminds me of? <clears throat> you know what, chat? You guys are like my son reading a book. He was read. We got him a book. It was like a, 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 a I forget what it was called dog something. It's like the same people who made Captain Underpants. And the only thing he said every time, oh, I'm on chapter two. I did it. I'm on chapter two. Oh, I'm on chapter three. Look, I'm at chapter four. He was like excited that he got to a point in the book, but not like caring about what was in the book. That's what you guys are right now. Oh, we got to 15 minutes. <laughs> I can't wait till we get to 20. <laughs> Single morning, Misha began to notice her aunt was acting kind of strange and constantly looking behind her and looking in her rearview mirror. And finally, Misha. Don't get me wrong, by the way. I'm absolutely proud of my son. He actually reread the book like twice. He actually does love the book. But it just made me think of, of chat because he was like excited that he got to a, a point in the book. I said to her aunt, you know, what's going on? What are you looking at back there? And Misha's aunt would say, you know, I know this sounds crazy, oh, but it right I'm now? pretty sure yeah. there's a white car that's we need following to get a, me. And another in fact, book of that over series. the past couple of days, I've seen what I think is the same white car following us anytime I'm driving you to school. And so Misha just turned around in her seat and looked out the back window, and she saw there were dozens of white cars on the road, so it was pretty difficult to tell which one her aunt was talking about. But as she's looking, you know, none of the cars seem suspicious. And so Misha turned back around and told her aunt, you know, I think you're just being paranoid. Nobody's following us. There's no reason to follow us. A Famous few minutes later, words. Misha's aunt pulled up alongside the front of the school and Misha said goodbye to her aunt. She thanked her. She hopped outside and she rushed into the school. And then Misha made her way up to the hallway where her first class was. And as she was walking down the hallway, her best friend, Cassidy Nurse, was walking up the hallway in her direction. And so right away, Misha sees Cassidy and she waves and smiles and begins walking was towards there, her. Guys. But Cassidy gave Misha this kind of weird, lukewarm smile and then quickly looked away from Misha and then Cassidy turned and bolted into the nearest classroom and uh -oh. so Misha just came to a stop and just looked at the doorway where her best friend has disappeared and she starts thinking uh -oh. to herself you know what's going on why did she do that that was so cold and then Misha began to think about the fact that actually over the past couple of days Cassidy had been acting really strange it was like she was trying to avoid Misha but Is Misha had no idea why her? it wasn't like they were fighting normally Misha and Cassidy were totally inseparable they had met earlier that school year and even though they were actually kind of far apart in age Cassidy was in eighth grade and Misha was in 12th grade it was like it didn't matter. It was like right away when they met each other, they had this special bond where they just had to be around each other all the time. They shared everything with each other. And That's certainly suspicious. anytime they saw each other in the That's hallway, they would stop to chat or even go into a nearby bathroom and do each other's hair and makeup and share any gossip they had recently heard. Mm. So for Cassidy to act like this was just totally uncharacteristic mm. and it really upset Misha. But just then the bell rang in the school, so Misha knew at this point she was now late for her class. And so she had to forget about whatever was going on with Cassidy and Misha just hustled down the hallway and went into her classroom. And so Misha, she takes her seat Ballin at the desk, was in the she puts her stuff down and she's getting ready to listen to the teacher when suddenly the principal you know what, comes- I, I feel like Ballin's just turning into a creepypasta. Like he has the power of every time he tells a story about something, he just, instantly knows everything about your life if he makes a story about you if if you happen to die and your and your death was so entertaining that it warranted a video 
and he makes a video on it, now he knows everything about your life. He's he's an anomaly. He he's he's SCP. He needs to be contained. Comes in without even knocking and without even saying anything to Misha's teacher, the principal walks right up to Misha and says, I need you to come with me. And right away, Misha's classmates, all who saw this, they begin ooing and aahing as if Misha is in huge See what trouble. I mean? But Misha's thinking to herself, I didn't do anything. Like, I have no idea what this is about. And so she kind of smiled like it was no big deal. She picked up her stuff and she followed the principal out into the hallway. But as Misha followed the principal down the hallway. To yeah, he doesn't find the stories. He makes them a reality. <laughs> towards the principal's office, Misha's smile faded and she began to wonder, you know, what is this about? What's going on? And then finally they got to the principal's office. The principal opened her up hand? the door. Misha went in first and the principal trailed behind her and shut the door behind them. When Misha looked into the principal's office, she saw there were already two people inside who she didn't recognize. It was two women who were very serious looking who were sitting on the side of the room. And as soon as Misha walked in, the two women, without introducing themselves, just told Misha to come over and take a seat next to them. And Misha, instead of doing that, just paused and looked at the women and said, what's going on? And at this, the two women kind of looked at each other and then one of the women piped up and said, Misha, we're here because the police sent us. And they sent us because of a photo that you and your very close friend Cassidy took. But before Misha could ask any questions like, Hold what up. photo are you talking about? And really what's going on here? These two women would explain the whole situation to Misha. And basically what they did is they told her this long, very convoluted story that involved Misha, it involved Cassidy, it involved this photo. And by the end of this story, this explainer story, Misha had taken a seat and put her hand over her mouth in utter disbelief. And then when the women were done explaining everything, Misha had a million questions, but it was like she was so overwhelmed with what she was just told that she just continued to sit there with her hand over her mouth, totally silent. And then finally, Misha did break the silence by saying, can I please just call my parents? And at this, the social workers said, no, you can't. And in fact, the police are already at your parents' house. They're talking to your parents right now. And so you can't talk to them and you can't even go home. In fact, you have to come with us for tonight. And then the two women got up and they made their way out of the principal's office. And they said, come on, Misha, you have to come with us. And so Misha stood up and she's totally flabbergasted. She really is like, how is this real life? And the principal at this point walked over and gave Misha a hug. And it was like suddenly the floodgates opened and Misha just began sobbing. So her aunt died. And as she did, the social workers just stood there waiting patiently. And, the person and then who as was soon as it seemed like Misha was done aunt. crying, they said, come on, you really and need to come with us. And so friend, Misha, she let go of the principal and she aunt. followed the two women out of the school, out to one of their cars. And once okay, they got- Okay, but what did they tell her? It's called suspense for a reason. The car, the two women explained to Misha that they were going to take her to a safe house for the night. But before they went to the safe house, they would need to make a quick pit stop at a local medical clinic. And so Misha, who at this point is not even asking questions, just said, okay. And so the women, they drove to the medical clinic. They were inside for just a matter of minutes. When they came back out again, they drove the rest of the way to the safe house. And when they got to the safe house, it just looked like a normal house on the outside, but on the- Uh-oh. Is this an elaborate kidnapping? Inside, when the two women were leading Misha through and showing her where- They're not from the police, are they? Where everything was, the kitchen, the bathroom, her bedroom. Uh -oh. All Misha saw was all these other kids who were staying there who were orphaned and abandoned. And oh. it started to give Misha a panic attack. And she asked the women again, can I please call my parents? And they said, no, you really can't. But one of the two social workers could tell that Misha, you know, she's having a breakdown. This is the worst day of her life, very likely. They keep showing photos of Misha. So I'm assuming she's dead. This is this is tart this is really turning into a grimace shake situation. And so one of the two women actually offered to Misha to come home with her and stay at her house instead of the safe house. Oh, and Misha agreed. And no. so that social worker and Misha, they would leave together. They would get into that woman's car oh, and they no. would drive to her house. And then the social worker told Misha that unfortunately now it was just a waiting game. They needed to wait for the police to get back in touch with them with more information. 
That night, as Misha lay in this woman's guest bedroom, looking up at the ceiling, wondering how the heck this had become her life, she began to think about the photo, the photo that her and Cassidy had took that had kind of started this whole horrible thing. And so Misha began to think about the day they took this picture, and all she remembered was that she and Cassidy were just kind of goofing around and smiling and making funny faces and just taking photos as they went. She certainly didn't think that one of those pictures they, they took would totally change already. her life. Know, right? The following morning, when Misha woke up, the social worker brought her to their office, the social worker's office, and there they met with the other woman who had first met Misha in the principal's office, and the three of them just sat in the office, not talking much much, eating chicken wings and other snacks, just literally waiting for police to call them. And finally, they would call. And when they did, one of the social workers answered the phone, and as she listened to what she was being told, she began to frown, and by the time she hung up, she was crying. The news from the police was the news Misha had been afraid of ever since sitting in the principal's office the day before and hearing this whole crazy story about her and Cassidy and this photo. The special the pit stop is. that Misha and the social workers made at the medical clinic the day before on the way to the safe house was so that Misha could get a DNA test. And now the police were calling back with the results of the test. And what the results showed was Misha Solomon was not actually Misha Solomon. Her real name was Zephanie Nurse. Wait, hold up. Was she kidnapped like at birth or something? 17 years earlier, Zephanie Nurse had been stolen out of her crib at the hospital in Cape Town. And despite a massive manhunt for her, she was never found. It, and so this was a huge oh, famous wait. case in Cape Town. I think I've heard of this Hate situation. Town, and most people assumed it would never be solved. But Misha's DNA had done just that. It proved that Misha's parents, who had loved her and raised her since she was a baby, were not actually her parents. Her mother, Lavana, was actually her kidnapper. And now she was under arrest. But even though this revelation was incredibly shocking and upsetting for Misha, it was not nearly as shocking as learning the identity of her real- Dude, Ash Tamer, shut the fuck up. You've been a downer this entire time. Stop complaining. Oh my God, if you don't like the video, just fucking leave. Biological parents. The social Goddamn. workers took Misha from their office to the police station where they told Misha her real biological parents were waiting to meet her. And so once they went inside the police station, you don't have to time Misha them out. I'm just saying, like, dude, if you if you're just gonna complain the entire fucking time, leave, dude. Like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> I just don't want people just complaining and whining in my chat that they don't like the video. I don't care. On to the social worker's arm tightly. She was incredibly nervous, and she was led down a hallway to a door that was shut. Fair enough. And then finally, when Misha was ready, she pushed the door open. It, it's your and her choice. Real prospect. parents who were sitting right in front of you. her. They stood up and they ran towards her, crying. But Misha just stood there, stunned and silent, staring at them, because these people—they were not strangers to her. She knew them extremely well. They were the parents of her best friend in the world, Cassidy Nurse, which meant. Misha, a.k.a. Zephanie Nurse, was Cassidy's sister. Wait, Months I don't, earlier, when what's, Misha... What's the picture, though? That's what I don't get. Misha and picture? Cassidy first met each other. Yeah. The reason they hit it off so quickly and the reason they had similar senses of humor and liked the same things and looked so dramatically similar is because they were literally sisters. They just didn't know it. And then one day, they took a series of selfie photos of themselves, and Cassidy, she would go home and show one of those photos to her parents and say, hey, look, my best friend, Misha Solomon, look how similar we look. And when Cassidy's parents looked at Misha Solomon, Holy they- Holy shit, wait, what the? They look exactly the same. Oh, okay, yeah, they look exactly the same instinctively knew that is our daughter that is zephanie nurse and so they would bring this photo to the police and the police would begin to investigate and during this investigation they began trailing misha so when misha's aunt told misha that she thought a white car was following her she wasn't just being paranoid those were investigators following Misha around, trying to get a feel for her schedule because they needed to approach her when she was alone in order to get a DNA sample. They were worried if they contacted Misha and tipped off what they were doing, she would tell her parents. Like what happens now though? Cause her mom is gonna get arrested. Does she just, 
go live with her now found out sister and parents and just live there now like i don't know that's such, that's such a crazy situation who were actually her kidnappers and then potentially mm -hmm. they might take misha and run away and so they couldn't risk that they had to basically follow her around and wait for an opening to get this dna test done and so this was also the reason why cassidy was acting so why strangely. would you kidnap a baby and stay in the same town lamau good point towards Misha in the few days before the truth was revealed. It's because Cassidy knew about this investigation and the police told her, you can't tip Misha off. She will tell her parents, her kidnappers, and they might abscond with her. And so Cassidy basically felt awkward and kind of just hid. The fuck? Abs abscond? Absconded abscond leave hurriedly and secretly dude i've never heard that word in my entire life absconded from misha for a couple of days the woman that misha had grown up with and called her mom for her whole life lavana saw i mean it's not like they really look similar woman was ultimately convicted of kidnapping and sentenced to 10 years in prison there has never been any evidence to suggest that Lavana's husband, so Misha's dad for her whole life, actually knew that the baby had been kidnapped because 17 years earlier, Lavana had been pregnant with their child, but it's believed she miscarried and Lavana did not share that with her husband. Instead, so what did she do? Stage a birth? Like how would the husband not know? And she told her husband that she had gone into labor while he was at work and delivered their child. And so that's how they had this I baby, Zephany. When in reality, so after funny. Lavana had miscarried, she had at some know. point dressed up like a nurse, gone into the hospital and stolen Zephany. For her part, Zephany, a.k.a. Misha, stayed in touch with both sets of parents, the fake ones and her biological ones. And she would say that, you know, she still loves the parents who kidnapped her because they raised her and they treated her well. And in fact, Zephanie would actually wear. I mean, I'm sure it's probably like, a, you know, she was in a crazed state because her child that she thought she was going to have died and then ended up stealing a child. So, yeah, they probably I mean, if you want to be a parent so bad that you're going to steal a child, I'm sure you're probably going to be a good parent. Doesn't mean you're a good person, though. <laughs> that beautiful flowing red dress that Lavana had stitched for her to her high school dance well after the news came out about who Lavana was. Misha also decided that she would just keep the name Misha because that was what she was used to instead of going back to her baby name, Zephanie. Zephanie is a very weird name, though. Stephanie, but with a Z. Zephanie. On a cold and snowy day in January of 1994, a land surveyor for the North Carolina Department of Transportation parked his car at the edge of Highway 421 in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. Wait, what? After walking just a few yards away, then looking desperately through the thick. Ah, uh, okay. It was a podcast situation. Okay. <clears throat> Those are cool stories. 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 I like those stories. Those are cool stories. Now it's time to walk away. I hope you enjoyed your stay. Did you laugh or cry or maybe subscribe? I'll thank you either way. You know I will miss you. Turn. Tell your friend or your mother to get me more views, please.